In the last lecture, we looked at the um, lead titanate, and by looking at the structure, which does not have any uh, screw axes or glide planes, uh, we were able to show that depending on where you locate a particular uh, atom, the multiplicity is determined. So, for example, at the general position x, y, z, the symmetry of the lead titanate gives us uh, 8 such atoms. But if I place it directly on this uh, tetrad, then I would have just one atom in the cell and so on. So, this was a fairly simple um, uh, example where just the point group symmetry tells us uh, how many atoms there should be in the cell depending on where we locate the species. And of course, the translational symmetry elements that we are interested in are the screw axes here and the glide planes and I am just going to explain uh, the terminology to you shortly. So, the screw axes uh, are straightforward. This is a dyad. So, basically a rotation of 180 degrees reproduces the structure and this is the repeat distance t along the dyad. Uh, so, in contrast to the normal dyad, you have here a screw axis. So, I rotate by 180 degrees and then translate by a fraction of the repeat distance along the screw axis and the symbol for uh, a dyad is uh, is for a dyad is this and you add some squiggly bits here to make it into a, a screw axis and 2 with a subscript 1 means a rotation of 180 degrees that means 360 divided by 2 and a translation of a half of the repeat distance okay 1 upon 2 of the repeat distance uh, so if i go back to this uh, 3 with the subscript 1 means uh, you've got a rotation of 360 divided by 3 which is 120 degrees and a translation of one third of the repeat distance parallel to the screw axis. Everyone happy with that? Okay. Okay. Uh, so, these are the symbols for the different uh, screw axes uh, possible. And here is an illustration of the fourfold axis. So, the fourfold axis uh, here 90 degree rotation reproduces the object. A 4 1 would mean that I rotate by 90 degrees <coughs> and translate by a quarter of the repeat distance. The repeat distance here is this. So, if I take this object here, rotate by 90 degrees, and translate upwards by a quarter of the repeat distance, I recover this object. And in this case, I rotate by 90 degrees and then translate by three quarters of the repeat distance to recover that object. <coughs> okay. So, the, these are the screw axes. And again, stop me if you have any questions. Now, in the case of the glide planes, uh, in almost every case, uh, the translations are parallel to the plane which acts like a mirror plane. So, there is a mirror plane followed by translations parallel to the plane. So, for example, axial glide here uh, which uh, involves a reflection and then a translation by half of the repeat distance here. Okay. So, that is just a oops, just a single translation all right, parallel to the plane. So, you reflect and then you translate by half A, B or C and diagonal glide for obvious reasons uh, involves two translations half along A plus half along B for example. Okay. So, you reflect and you translate by two vectors both of them parallel to the uh, glide plane. Diamond glide is a quarter of those two translations. So, quarter A and quarter C and there is a special case in the uh, for body centered cubic structures where there are three translations. So, here you have a quarter along here, a quarter along here and a quarter out of the plane of the board. Okay. So, the terminology is for axial glide we use A, B or C and for diagonal glide we use N and for diamond glide we use uh, the symbol D for, for the plane. 
Okay, so now I'm going to illustrate uh, all this with uh, an example of uh, cuprite, which is a copper oxide, Cu2O, in which uh, you know, without considering the uh, translational symmetry elements, we cannot solve the structure. So it's not like lead titanate where we don't have any screw or glide axis. Here we are going to take account of the translational symmetry elements and develop a space group. So a point group is when all the symmetry elements pass through a single point. So obviously if they all pass through a single point, there, there's no translations involved. And the space group includes those translations. So there are 32 point groups, but 230 space groups, uh, all of which are tabulated in the International Union of Crystallography tables. So the point of this lecture is that you need to understand what to do, okay, rather than memorize a lot of uh, space groups. Okay, so uh, this is a crystal of cuprite. Just by looking at that shape, uh, can you tell me which um, lattice type that would be? Out of the seven crystal classes, which one would that belong to? Just by looking at the shape, okay? <coughs> Cubic, and uh, give me a reason. Yeah, it's like a regular octahedron, isn't it? Yeah. yeah? And what that means uh, specifically is that you have triads, and there are four four triads because there are four of these faces, right? You you can see here there are four triangular faces here, and the defining symmetry of a cube is four triads, right? So just by looking at this uh, shape, which is close to equilibrium, we have. Uh, knowledge about the crystal class to which this will belong. So it will be cubic. And this is what the unit cell looks like. It's cubic. And we have two oxygen atoms here. We have oxygen atoms at 0, 0, 0 and at a half, half, half positions. Um, I don't know if it's helpful, but uh, I believe this is a movie which uh, doesn't want to work, okay? Now, we know it's cubic, but is it primitive, is it body-centered, or is it uh, face-centered, cubic? Okay, it's difficult to tell, isn't it, from this? So, what do we do? We draw projections, right? So here is uh, a projection that I drew earlier with four of these unit cells next to each other. So by looking at that, can you tell me uh, what lattice type it is? Sorry? Okay. Um, so face-centered because you've got these positions at a half and these at zero. Yeah? But is the environment here the same as the environment here? It isn't, is it? Because look, uh, here you've got um, uh, this atom at a quarter and this atom at three quarter, whereas here you've got it pointing in another direction. Okay, So um, it's, it's actually <coughs> primitive cubic. All of these atoms uh, have different environments. So we've, we've concluded it's primitive cubic. What would be the motif that we place at each? How many atoms would there be in the motif? Yeah, that's right. So there's a total of six atoms per lattice point, which is at the corner of the cube. Okay? So by drawing a projection, it's very easy to see whether the environment at different locations is identical and you know this is done using crystal maker but in an exam you wouldn't have a have crystal maker but I think it's worth drawing four cells next to each other okay, to visualize properly 
Okay, so these are the uh, atoms and their locations. If I define my origin over here, then these are the coordinates of the copper atoms and these are the coordinates of the oxygen atoms which are placed at every single uh, lattice point of a primitive cube to generate the structure. Everyone happy with that? Okay, so so far so good. Um, so I'm going to uh, generate the space group symbol and all space group symbols start with the lattice type. So here we have uh, P for primitive. Okay, so we've got one part of the space group. It's a, a primitive lattice and we know what the motif is. Now can you see in here any glide plane? Okay. So bear in mind that a glide plane will involve a reflection and then a translation or two translations parallel to the glide plane itself. That's a, um, is that a glide plane? Say 110 would be this plane, okay? Uh, sorry, what is it? It's, it's an important symmetry plane, but is it a glide plane? No. What is it? Because that's a question coming up. Yeah, it's a mirror. Because uh, if you look at the 110 plane here, then you can reflect this half, half, and so on, okay? But can you? Correct. So the glide plane <laughs> lies over there. And if you look at this uh, atom at three quarters, I reflect it along here, there's nothing. But then I translate <coughs> over here, and I get an atom at three quarters, and then I translate downwards and I get an atom at a quarter. I recover that atom at a quarter. Yeah? Can you see that? Okay. So three quarters, three quarters, a translation of half, half uh, the distance along here gets me another atom at three quarters, but to recover the atom at a quarter, I need to have a second translation okay, downwards. So what kind of a glide plane is it? So remember uh, our definitions, hmm? n-glide, because there are two translations by half and half, right? Okay. Oh, I've got it written <laughs> down over there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Now, can you see um, what would happen here for this atom? So if I, if I reflect uh, this atom at a half, I get that. Then I translate by the same translation here. And translate upwards or downwards to recover the atom at 0 and 1. Okay. So that's an n-glide plane. And if we think about our, our notation, the system of notation for, uh, for um, lattice types which have high order axes, then the first symmetry element that I put after the symbol P should be the one parallel to the z-axis. And therefore, I can label this as primitive with an n-glide, okay? If we were thinking about point groups, this would be a mirror because we ignore the translations. But as I pointed out to you in the last lecture on pyrite, if we ignore those translations, we'll get the number of atoms in the cell wrong and I'll come back to pyrite at the very end. Okay, so we're building up the point group symbol. So uh, first, we've got this symmetry element parallel to the z-axis. And um, what would be, even without thinking, what should be the next symmetry element? Uh, remember, we are dealing with a cube. Hmm? Triad, yeah. Because the defining symmetry of a cube is triad, so you always have the second one as three. If you look at your table of point group uh, symmetries, there will always be a triad in the second um, symbol. 
somewhere there's a table yeah let's just open it um, listing the point group symmetries ah yeah so it's on page 17 and in the cubic case you will see that the second second symbol is always a 3 okay because you can't ignore the fact that a cube is defined by uh, its triads okay But um, if you look at this uh, 3D diagram, you can see that there is a triad here. But it's not just a triad, right? Uh, we, we have a, a center of symmetry in this. Uh, if, I, if I rotate this by 180 degrees, and then I invert through the center, I recover this. So it's actually a roto inversion axis. It's a bar 3 axis, OK? Can you see that? If I rotate by uh, 120 degrees, I get that. And then I invert through the center, I recover that. Okay? So a triad combined with the center of symmetry is a bar 3. Uh, this is just looking at the body diagonal. And you can see that uh, although this looks like a hexagon, the z um, coordinates are different. The, these three are at a half height along z. And these three are at a height one uh, along z, the z-axis. Everyone happy with that? OK, so in our point group uh, symmetry, we've now got uh, p and, uh, sorry, space group, primitive, glide plane, and a bar three along there. Okay. So primitive, glide plane, and a bar three along there. And you identified that we also have a mirror plane. So um, the convention, again, is that first we have the symmetry along z. Then we have something which is at 90 degrees to the z-axis, which we've got the glide plane. And then the dividing plane, yeah, uh, the tertiary axis. So the mirror plane here, you can see that it's a pure mirror plane, no glides involved. Okay three quarters reflects to three quarters and so on. So our total space group symbol is P n bar 3 m. And that completely defines uh, the symmetry of cube right. Okay. So a space group symbol will always begin with the lattice type, uh, followed by th the equivalent of the point groups, but including translational symmetry elements if they are present. Okay. Is everyone happy with that? OK, so let's see how to make use of this now. Uh, I've, I've done it uh, sort of um, in reverse, that I've shown you the structure, and therefore we've derived the space group. Uh, but in practice, you would, you would try a space group and see if you can solve the structure, if the density of the material, et cetera, et cetera, is consistent with the space group. Uh, so the implications of uh, this space group uh, are that, for example, um, so the space group is uh, P n bar 3 m. If I convert that into a point group, that would be a m 3 m here. And if I locate an atom at an arbitrary position, then these symmetry elements would generate 48 such atoms. So it would be a very, very dense material if the lattice parameters are fixed. So x, y, z is just an arbitrary point which is not located on any symmetry element except a monad, uh, a one-fold axis. Okay? So if I just place uh, a single dot here, all the others will be generated uh, by operating with the symmetry elements m, 3, m. And the bold lines here indicate mirror planes, all right? <coughs> so for example, uh, the circumference is a mirror plane. These are mirror, 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 and so on. And this uh, triangle with a hole in it uh, is your inversion. Um, so with that space group symmetry, if you place an atom at the corner, then on reflection to the glide plane 
and translation by half and half upwards, you recover an atom located on the face center. Similarly, if you look at this uh, atom located on the mirror plane, then reflection followed by translation this way and downwards leads to the oxygen atom over here. Doing the same operation for this glide plane would again lead to a, an atom at three quarters, translation by half and translation downwards, so it leads to the same atom at this position. Therefore, we will have two oxygen atoms and four copper atoms in the unit cell uh, because uh, basically we've got these at the phase centers which contribute three and one at the origin which contributes uh, one because of the eight corners that we have. And if you look at uh, your space group tables, they will look like this. This is a, a greatly simplified space group table. There are lots and lots of symmetry positions for which these calculations have been done. So if I locate at a general position, I will have 48 of these um, atoms. Uh, if I locate on the mirror plane, then I will have 24. And a location where there's a triad passing through and a mirror, I will have four. And for that position, I will have two, two atoms. Okay. So the important thing about the space group is that it takes account of translational elements of symmetry. And therefore, um, you get the correct number of atoms inside the unit cell. And you can check that by measuring the lattice parameters and measuring the density of the crystal. If it doesn't work, then you try another space group within the cubic system and so on to solve the structure. OK, so everyone happy with that? So we are doing well in terms of time, all right? So ask questions if you have questions. Uh, now, this is a, a picture of pyrite from Peru. And the reason uh, why uh, it's quite famous is because it looks golden. And you think you've discovered gold, but it's actually iron sulfide. And again, from the shapes of these crystals, if you look carefully, uh, they don't look different from the shape for cuprite. In other words, uh, this is cubic. Uh, there are four uh, triads. And this is the diagram that I showed you earlier, where if you just look at the point groups, we would have too many atoms. If I place something at an arbitrary position, I would end up with these 24 atoms, whereas this, which is at an arbitrary position, we've only got eight of those atoms. And the reason is that we don't actually have mirror planes. These are glide planes here. So if I reflect uh, this uh, across that glide plane and then translate this way and upwards, I recover this position at, six, uh, at 0.61. Whereas if this was a mirror plane, then I would have one atom here at 0.11 and another one here at 0.61. And that would add up to 24 because I've generated two extra per atom. Okay. So uh, without taking account of uh, glide planes, you have the incorrect number of uh, atoms. These are screw axes. So if I rotate this by 180 degrees and then translate parallel to the axis, I get the atom at 0.61 and so on. So uh, in the case of pyrite, uh, what kind of a, a glide plane is this? <coughs> so I, I reflect and then translate. Yeah, OK? OK, uh, so that basically deals with uh, all aspects of symmetry, uh, including point groups and space groups. Uh, I'm now going to show you something really um, quite interesting, because very often we are not looking at crystals in isolation. <coughs> we look at precipitates which are forming in the matrix. And the shapes of precipitates uh, are determined by many things. So for example, the shape could be determined by minimization of strain energy or by minimization of interfacial energy. But supposing that strain 
does not play a role. So if you have transformations in which or precipitation reactions in which you have a lot of diffusion, then there isn't going to be a great deal of strain energy because diffusion is like the flow of matter and it cancels out uh, strains. So let's assume that we are dealing with systems, which is the vast majority of systems where there's a lot of diffusion to form a precipitate. And this is one such example where we have a, a, a silver-rich precipitate omega, which is forming inside aluminum, and it forms with this specific uh, orientation relationship. So this is an uh, orthorhombic uh, precipitate, and of course aluminum is uh, cubic f, right? And these are the point group symmetries of the aluminum and the omega. So on these uh, sketch diagrams, I've got the symmetry, point group symmetry of the omega and the point group symmetry of the aluminum. When you form a precipitate in this way in aluminum with no strain energy, it will tend to form <coughs> in such a way that its shape reflects the common symmetry of the two lattices. Okay? So it's the shared symmetry between the two lattices. So if you look at these two stereographic projections, uh, and they are presented in, uh, in a way where you can recognize common symmetries, then obviously the dyad would be common to both of these. Okay? and a mirror plane. And if you look at the shape of the precipitate in a transmission electron microscope, then you'll see its shape is like this, and the shape has a dyad passing through it, and there's a mirror plane normal to it. Okay. And it's presented in the same orientation relationship that we see, and you can see the patterns, electron diffraction patterns, which we'll do in uh, the next lecture, they also have a dyad. This is from uh, omega and this is from aluminum. Both of these have a shared dyad and a mirror plane normal to the dyad. Okay. So this is quite useful because uh, very often uh, we, we can determine, in determine the shapes in three dimensions using transmission electron mic microscopy of even the smallest precipitates and understand these shapes. So, for example, molybdenum carbide is hexagonal, right? and its shared symmetry will result in rods of molyb uh, molybdenum carbide forming inside a body-centered cubic lattice and so on. When strain plays a role, it is overwhelming, right? Uh, because strain energies can be very, very large uh, compared with the driving force uh, for transformation, and therefore strain will dominate the precipitate. And at the early stages of the formation of a precipitate, the strain energy may play an important role because uh, nucleation um, is greatly affected by small variations in strain energy or interface energy because the surface to volume ratio is very large when the nucleus is small. But when it grows, it will tend to adopt a shape consistent with the common symmetry of the two lattices. Okay, so um, that's the end of uh, today's lecture. I have a question for those who are going to be supervised by uh, myself. The, I think half the class uh, has supervision <coughs> with me. Um, is 12 o'clock on certain days when you don't have lectures, etc., a good time for supervisions or not? Hmm? Yeah? Uh, we should have questions from 11. Yeah. So uh, I, I looked at the timetable, and there are some days when 12 o'clock is free. Yeah. 12.30, okay. So 12.30 would be a good time to have a supervision? Or yeah. The reason is uh, I, have, um, I have to go to London on many days after uh, lunch. Yeah? So, okay. So I will set up uh, a Google Calendar where you can book supervisions uh, in the slots which are free on your timetables, okay? For example, such cases as one. Yeah, yeah. So uh, all that is on the timetable. And tomorrow we have an examples class uh, here, okay? Okay, thank you.